or if you guys could just find your name tags, it's going to be a huge panel. Jerry Campbell, CEO of Collecta, Matt Cutts from Google, Kimball Musk, are you around? Oh, there you are, okay. Uh, CEO of One Riot, Vipul Ved Prakash, CEO of Topsy, <coughs> Ido Seagal, who is the founder of, uh, was the founder of uh, Religions and is now a private investor, and Seen Suture from Microsoft, and Danny Sullivan from Search Engine Land. <laughs> We really packed this panel, and uh, you know there were more people who wanted to be on it, and, and would have been great. Um, and I just sort of had to cut it off. Uh, so, you know, I've been writing about this recently because I've been kind of fascinated with uh, this whole idea of, of uh, you know, real-time search and what does that mean. Danny just did a great post yesterday, uh, sort of with his definition, which we'll get into. I'd like to start with Ido though, because he 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 started doing this a long time ago, um, and he got me thinking about sort of the difference between regular search and real-time search is sort of the, like, the difference between memory and consciousness. <coughs> and, you know, Google's like, it, it searches memory. Uh, and what, what real-time search is trying to do is, is try to, trying to search consciousness or, or at least, you know, uh, surface the most interesting things in your consciousness. But, you know, can you talk a little bit about sort of where how we got to this, this spot, why, why are there, you know, seemingly two dozen real-time search engine startups today? Um, what is it about this moment and, and, um, and, and, and just a little bit of a history? Sure. Uh, first, uh, it's really surreal for me to be at this kind of an event given that uh, when I set on the journey, everybody looked at me like I'm a, some crazy person. So it's, 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 it's great to see it arrive at this caliber and, and people recognize the importance uh, of this, and I think we're all very fortunate to participate in this because I think when people will look back at this era and the stuff that really changed how we experience the world, search technology is going to be a very profound effect on us as a species and the way we evolved. Uh, you referenced uh, memory. I think the world we live in with Google is fundamentally different than the world we lived in before. My five-year-old is going into a world where his perception of the world is fundamentally going to be different because of that and the contribution of the people here uh, on the effect of how he experiences the real-time aspect of his life, not just when he tries to recover something, is, is also uh, going to be profound. And uh, that's what kind of kept me going over a decade. I started it in 1999. It was a company called eNow. And it was meant to basically, if any piece of information is generated anywhere on the planet, it was supposed to put it on your screen the second it's published. and. Uh, it's, it's funny that uh, I was talking to Peter Hirschberg before outside. He mentioned that there's very little institutional memory in the technology space, and that's really true. And I think it's actually probably a good thing because you get the naivete you need when people come back to the table and try to solve the problem uh, to address it and actually solve it. Uh, when I set to, to solve up the problem, I said, where, where are there people that have dealt with this problem of real-time search over a mass amount of data? And actually, there's an industry that's been doing this for decades, and that's the intelligence uh, industry. Um, the NSA basically has been doing real-time search for a few decades. Uh, many of you probably heard of the Echelon conspiracy theory. It's not really a conspiracy theory. But that's what they do. They, they tap everything and they're looking for signals uh, for other purposes. So that's kind of the, maybe the evil side and we're trying to take those technologies uh, towards something different. Uh, and actually that's where I recruited people from the intelligence community and we built out that system. Uh, and it really is the same kind of problem domain when you think about it and, and all the stuff you need to monitor. So the whole notion of the collective consciousness, this notion that you can have a system, a technology system, that has within memory, within working RAM, everything that people are talking about right now and therefore computationally can do things with it that weren't possible before and extract insight out of it is really where the game is headed. It's, and if I were to tell you that I want to take a system that has the entire internet in working memory, and can extract insight out of it, that's an impossibility. But if I told you that I want to take the last five minutes of everything published on the planet and put it in memory and apply all the best uh, IP that the world has generated in the domain of search, that's feasible and that's what these companies are doing. And out of that stems something that uh, we haven't seen yet. And it's really, that's where I draw the analogy to consciousness because that's something that's 
transient, it exists in real time, it's not memory, and it's a different, it's a whole different problem domain, and it's really exciting to, to see what's going to happen. Uh, and I mean, I have more to say about it, but I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's move on. I mean, so let's, let's just try to define a little bit what, what is real time search right now. You know, Danny thinks that real time search is Twitter search, uh, and, um, you know, and uh, Kimball, and others on, on, the, uh, on the panel think that it's basically everything on the internet with a, um, you know, with, with sort of a freshness component or a recency component on it. That's a wide range of things. Um, so let's discuss. Uh, why don't we start with Kimball, then we'll... Sure. I mean, I think the, twi the tweets are amazing. I mean, we just treat it like content. So we wouldn't actually differentiate. But the biggest argument I would say is that real-time search is... a. a Maybe I should talk about traditional search for a second. Traditional search is, in our mind, trying to find the right answer. Uh, it's almost like going to a library. And you know, Google, probably the best librarians in the world, finding you the right answer. So if you search for Michael Jackson, you'll get michaeljackson.com. That is the right answer. Real-time search is the right answer right now, which yesterday when I did a search, it was the memorial photos, it's the tweets, it's the videos that people are taking, it's the fact that they're watching Thriller, so real-time search is the right answer right now, and it really combines content, tweets, images, videos, and so forth. Danny, why do you think it's only Twitter? So I, I don't think it is all Twitter. It's just that Twitter's the leader. W what I was trying to explain is that the, the difficulty you have is that when we talk about real-time search, if I were to talk to you about image search or shopping search or web search, and I showed you a panel of search engines, all the image search engines would be the same. All the shopping search engines would be the same. All the web search engines would be the same. You would know what to expect. You would get the same kind of content that comes back from them in basically the same manner. You don't get that confused when you go to Google or, or Bing. You know, not that confused, although one's superior. Anyway, so, but when you start talking real-time search, Collecta is radically different than one, one riot. They're, they're, they're different experiences. At Collecta, I'm doing a search and I'm getting back a lot of content, and in particular microblog posts, very heavy on Twitter because that's where most of the stuff is coming from. On one riot, I'm getting back links and news articles that are coming from what's being shared. So what I'm really trying to say is, if we're going to talk real-time search, we need to have better definitions of what it is. Not that one is necessarily better than the other, just so that we know what we're talking about, so then if we're consumers or users, we understand what we're interacting with. And so when I was saying that, that real-time search is basically Twitter search, what I mean is first that through Twitter and a few other services, you have the ability to publish content within a few seconds. Unlike with a regular blog, for example, where you're going to, if, if, if an earthquake hit and I log into WordPress, I'm still going to have to write a little headline, still going to have to write a little thing, I have to push a button, the earthquake hits, and I'm on Twitter or some other service, like if Facebook's up and I've got my status update, Boom, within seconds it's out there. So to me that's microblogging, and Twitter is basically microblog search because that's where my content is on that kind of very fast real-time publishing. If Facebook finally gets the status update out where, where everybody can have it and, and see all the everyone posts that are out there has been asked for earlier today, then they're going to be a huge rival in that space. And, and microblog search or real-time search, if you want to extend it that way, won't just be Twitter search. It'll be more than that. And then in terms of what you would call taking everything that's being shared through Twitter, through Facebook, through all the different services, and try to assemble those in some way to say, these are the most popular, or we're going to let you do keyword searches and rank content across the web in that way. I don't have a good answer for what you call that. Um, maybe you can call that real-time search as well. Maybe you're calling that social sharing search because this is the way people are, are sharing their data through social networking aspects. Um, it, again, I can't stress enough, it's not that one is necessarily better than the other. It's just that they're two different creatures and I think it's helpful to understand what you're dealing with. Right. Well, Can I, can I jump in on that a little bit? Go ahead. I'd like I, to help it, define. If, and as you jump in, I mean, uh, I think that there's, there's also a dichotomy here between this, um, you know, sort of purist approach, which is, I think you have a very purist approach of just, you do, you put in a search term and on Collecta, you just see a stream of the results as they happen in real time. Um, and versus maybe in one riot um, or some of these other search engines where there, there are other filters by, that are, you know, different authority filters 
Um, and I think filters is the key word. I mean, if, if you right. just tap into the stream, but, you but get the everything. Sec but the second that you put a filter on, it becomes less real time. And I, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, so, so let me, I'm going to start a little bit and pick up where Ido left off, which if you look at, at things, and Danny, you nailed it too, there's an acceleration of publishing. So if you go all the way back to the printing press, all the way up through today, there's an acceleration of the ability to express information. And, and Danny, you're keying in on the short message capability and how, how that gives us the ability to express information more quickly. I would say it's, it's a little bit dangerous to, to discard all of the previous ways that people express information through, whether it's news stories, blog posts, images, that kind of stuff. So there's, there's, there's a lot of information being published that's real time in nature that's not necessarily definitionally social. So that's the first thing. Given that, I would define real-time search as being what are people saying right now about my topic. I wouldn't necessarily say what's the most important link right now because that, to me, is, a, is not real-time. If people have retweeted it, and if it's already being aggregated up and counted, it's not as real-time as something that's being expressed now. Yeah, and I'm not saying, hang on one second, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying they're just two different models. And the two different models that I have in mind are um, sometimes I want the highlights from the game and sometimes I want to actually watch the game. And so that's the difference that I see in the approaches that we have in our user experiences. So yeah, we're showing the game as it unfolds. We're showing those various pieces. Filtering is important. I don't think filtering slows things down. I think ranking slows things down, right? When you take 50 things, throw them into a bucket, and decide which one is most important, that's an operation that's computationally heavy, potentially, and slows things down. If I'm taking every single result, looking at it saying, should I or should I not show this, that's pretty meaningful in terms of real-time ability. Those filters happen very quickly. And the way Collector works right now, we're not showing roughly 90% of the content that we're bringing in. So as fast as that, that flow appears, we're still holding back 90% of that content, trying to figure out exactly what is the right thing to show over time. So to me, real time is truly what's happening now. You're holding they, it back based on what? At the end of, what are you holding it back on, based on? Isn't that a filter? Uh, it, it's that we're, we're you know, we're figuring it out. It, it, it is filter. filtering. It's a, it's a coarse filter, and over time, filtering becomes more and more you know, elegant, and ultimately, you add in social networks and all kinds of other okay. things. So, Kimball, respond briefly, and then I want to hear from Google and Microsoft. Sure. I mean, basically, to us, the, the drinking from the fire hose is a ticking time bomb. I mean, if you, if you think about you know, even filtering 90 percent, I'm not sure what filters you'd use, but filtering 90 percent of, of what's going on at the Iran election, you're still only going to get a tiny slice. And, you, and a, good, a good portion of that, even today, is spam. And in a year's time, it'll be probably 90 to 95 percent spam. So I think the, the, question, the question I view ranking is, is basically another filter. And if you don't filter content, you're going to get spam, you're going to get more spam, and you're going to get more spam. And you're just going to drown in fire hose. So fire Matt, hose and spam are not parallel. <laughs> Matt, could you talk a little bit about what is Google doing in, with real-time search? You know, Everyone from Larry Page to Marissa Meyer can't stop talking about it. I <laughs> don't know, but I, I still don't know what you guys are doing in this field. So enlighten us, please. Sure. Um, and I'm not here today to announce any new product, but you did see from Google the uh, PubSub, Hubbub stuff that sort of turns this slow RSS into very fast RSS, which is kind of nice. Um, but at least at Google, from the beginning, we've thought about freshness of content. So when I joined Google in early 2000, we had not updated our index in three or four months. And we had to have a war room to figure out how are we going to get to monthly updates. And it was clear even back then you needed to have relevance, you needed to have comprehensiveness, and you needed to have freshness. And so in 2003, we moved from monthly updates to daily updates. And then in 2007, you know, 2005, we had blog search. And then 2007, that got integrated into the main search corpus. So you could do a blog post. And 10, 15 minutes later, that could be showing up in the main Google search. So certainly from our perspective, the things that we've learned from blog search include the fact that people don't always want to go to blogsearch.google.com. Sometimes they just want it easily integrated. So we put a lot of effort into trying to rework and re-architect our systems to make it as fresh as possible. And that's ongoing work. That will always be continuing. I'd like to joke that the half-life of code at Google is about six months. So you can write a complete system, come back in six months, and there's some new part that's been replaced or has been re-architected to be better. Um, it's certainly true that there is worries about spam. My official job is working on spam, and people are just now realizing what an opportunity Bitly and TinyURL and Twitter and Facebook and all those things represent. So, but when Marissa Meyer you know, talks about how real-time search is 
you know, a priority mm -hmm. today, and when Larry Page says that you have to get faster and faster, yeah. um, I mean, that to me indicates that uh, that you guys are, um, you know, putting some, some new resources to it. What, what you just said is that, yeah, you know, we, we've always been getting faster. The index is getting faster. There's nothing new. So what, uh, are you taking a different approach, or are you just, you're, you're just indexing now every... Every I think half hour instead of every hour. Yeah, very good question. The way I would characterize it is we're always looking at how to get better, including on freshness. And it's safe to say that we have a fair number of people and really smart engineers who are working on how do you get the freshest, best possible results. So for example, at uh, Searchology, just like six, seven weeks ago, we introduced a new option where if you do in your web browser a search on Google, you'll see a little show options. And you can click on that. And then you can see results from the last 24 hours, recent results, seven days, one month, stuff like that. So we've been building in more and more data information, and it's safe to assume we're going to continue paying a lot of attention to real-time information, how do you index it, how do you return it in a relevant way. How important is real-time for Microsoft, and what are you guys doing there? Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely a key area, right? I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of discussion about it. I think that, um, and people have probably seen the, the little first step that we made to try to you know, let people find some of the uh, the Twitter users that they might be very interested in see what they're saying in, in real time. And yeah, filtering is an important part of that. Um, so uh, in terms of what we're doing going forward, instead of talking about any specific thing, I just want to kind of talk about what I think about real time search and how it'll affect in general the way that we think about seeing things on the web. I think that um, when you see there's, as Danny subdivided it, you know, you, you've got search and discovery, yes, and then within search you've got things, you're searching the links, uh, and you're searching things about the links that are going on in real time, and you've actually got the content of the updates, right, the microblogs or whatever, you know, the tweets, the status updates on Facebook, and the, uh, on the links, you can, I mean, yes, the content existed, but what you can find out there is what people are thinking about it in real time. Right? Hey, so, you know, the sentiment about a link may be changing. Right? What is that thing? What is this really meaning? And uh, exposing to the user, sometimes that will be really relevant to the user, that, that sentiment. So that's an interesting area, I think. And then the other interesting area is, of course, the actual content that's being told in real time. Yes, there's an earthquake. Uh, I, I, was using, I use this example a lot. Um, I found this minor league baseball game uh, going on in... in uh, I think it was Hickory, uh, South Carolina, or whatever, and um, it was the, the score. Was, I mean, there's a guy giving a blow by blow of the game. Here's what's going on, and the only place it existed was this corpus. Right. So, right? so it's what very extent, interesting. To what extent, to be a bit pro the provocative on the on this subject, uh, I mean, I, I, it's kind of always refreshing to see that you know com companies like Google and Microsoft. Uh, struggle with some s small guys like Twitter. And I think the reality is that unless they have the feed uh, from Twitter, they can't really participate to the extent that Twitter can create an experience. It's just, and you mentioned, Danny, that it's not all about Twitter. But it, right now, it actually kind of is because of liquidity. Maybe it won't be down the road as Facebook opens up. Right now, Twitter is the only game in town for having enough liquidity to create that level of experience where it's really this sense of this different phenomenon as opposed to Google News, which is an amazing product, which does great work at both seeing chronologically and, and clustered. But un until Twitter or Facebook gives uh, these, these majors access to the full feed in real time, there's absolutely no way from an engineering perspective for them to even access it. And, and the reality is that Twitter and Facebook control their destiny to that extent. Uh, neither of these companies can, can uh, force them to give them the feed. And they can't spider it either, because that's a physical impo impossibility. It's just not physically possible. So if you were Twitter, well, you would not give the feed to Google? I would time. if I decided to not sell my company down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's one, I mean, it's true. So there's a lot of different aspects, I think, that in, in making a good real-time search. One is getting access to the corpus in, in real time. And that's, that's, that's something. Uh, there is a relevant point. You need something point. to index. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a relevant point there that I think I saw the statistic that 5% of the uh, Twitter users are publishing uh, some dominant fraction, like 60-something, 70%. Well, like 90%. Yeah. yeah. So, so that helps. Um, but yeah. the other aspect... So, so that, 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 that takes you back people. to Technorati and blog search. Yeah, it's true. So the other half of the thing, though, is 
uh, access to a powerful search technology stack. I mean, there's just a lot of technology that's been invented. And, you know, Twitter is, yes, they have access to the corpus, but they're starting, you know, from very low there, right? Yeah, and so we have yeah. an advantage there. So the, there's a balance. The, the, well, can, data. can you talk a little bit about this? Because you have, obviously, you think Twitter is very important, and you use, uh, you know, Twitter as a ranking, um, as a way to rank search right. results. Can you explain how you do that? And do you have access to the fire hose? And uh, how, how do you see, do you agree with what Ido said about, you know, they're going to give the fire hose to small guys, but not to the big guys? Well, we're actually uh, uh, sampling search.twitter.com, so it's not, uh, we're not using the fire hose, we're sampling search.twitter.com. That's how we get uh, uh, most of the content in our index. Uh, we, we think of the, the feed as a signal to, uh, identify the web that is important to people right now. So in, in some ways, the supply of the signal acts as a proxy for demand. When people are talking about uh, certain keywords, we know that there are other people who want to search for them right now. And uh, that is what we use for uh, ranking results. So we are able to, because we have a notion of uh, timestamp on when certain things are said, and we have a concept of who is saying them and what are their rela historical relationships with other people, how people are essentially getting attention from other people. We can use all this information to rank results. Um, I think the Twitter feed is definitely one of the largest and fastest growing sources of real-time information, but most of the web is turning into a stream rather than um, you know, a corpus of sort of anonymous documents. It's becoming a stream of uh, annotated and attributed uh, uh, elements from RSS to, to uh, um, Twitter to uh, even to wikis, to blog comments, to reviews. Everything is turning into this feed form factor, which is uh, um, basically going to be more and more available to everyone to, to mine. Right. So what, if anyone has questions, we have about five more minutes. You can line up to the, um, to the, to the microphones. Can I talk about the, uh, the, the Twitter versus other sources of, of content sure, for a yeah. second? So how, how much are you seeing Twitter as, you know, what percent of, of uh, results are, is Twitter for you? Yeah, I mean, I think tw Twitter for us is about 20% of our data that we bring in. Um, we, we, have, we actually have a panel of users, about two and a half million people have downloaded, kind of like a compete panel, um, have downloaded a toolbar to participate, to share what's important to them. And so Twitter makes up about 20%. Our data, our own data makes up about 50% of our corpus. And then we have 30% of data coming from other sources like Dig and a few others, which we'll talk about in a, in a few months. But we absolutely think if you, if you, stuck with, if you stick to Twitter alone, you're going to have, A, a very biased data set, and unfortunately, a, a spam-filled data set uh, to, to, to an extreme, actually. So the other thing is that it's, it sticks. If you focus on just Twitter, you end up with a lot of, uh, a lot of weight in the head, and it's very difficult to cover timely topics in the tail, because Twitter tends to be kind of a flock mentality, from what we've seen. So what, Matt, you mentioned a little bit about the spam problem on Twitter. What, define that. Like, how is it different than the spam problem on the web? Is, is it a different form? Yeah, it is, because uh, on the web, spam is, is anonymous, right? But Twitter and, and Facebook, to some extent, try to bring identity into it. And so you've got all these cases where you've got you know, fake Sarah Palins. I've had fake Matt Cutts's two or three times, right? And, and if people follow the same people you follow and then send a link, uh, you know, just earlier today, somebody's like echoing something that Danny Sullivan says, so there's scrapers, all sorts of things. So it's really strange to have been in web spam for about eight years and to watch the exact same schemes start to play out, except in an accelerated time frame. And, and the nice thing is they do have a smart group of folks over at Twitter, and so, you know, I, I think that they will be tackling those issues. but. It's amazing just how quickly the spammers can latch on to any given loophole. And you know, if it's a, a worm one weekend, then it might be you know phishing or malware the next weekend. And and people aren't always ready for that, especially okay. if they we, think it's a friend. We, we have time for maybe one or two questions, and then we're going to wrap up. Five minutes. Okay, go ahead. Can you can you turn that on, please? Can you turn on that mic? Okay, go ahead. Try. Uh, shout. Talk really loud. Shout. There we go. Okay. You could Twitter it. <laughs> the mic's on. The mic's on. It's just, it's happening already. And, you know, if 
finding it to bet my money's on Microsoft because of their relationship with Facebook to get to a place where they have uh, the right level of liquidity and, and, a, and a cohesive search experience. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's happening. I mean, Facebook recognizes this. They're, everything they're doing is about recognizing the threat that Twitter represents, and they see that unless they have this public feed, a uh, large part of the game will, will escape them, and now, uh, and they've de demonstrated that they're the kind of leadership that can uh, make those kind of changes, regardless of uh, the focus group, which is the users. So, 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 um, Sean, can you respond to that and tell us why Microsoft is sort of snoring their heads off on this? I, I don't see you guys being really active. Um, no, I think that uh, I think that there's a big promise in the in you know, in what Facebook is, is trying to do with, uh, you know, and making their status updates uh, a little more public, I think that, that they have a huge user base and they can catch up a lot uh, in terms of the uh, volume of publicly available real-time content. And uh, that'll definitely be an interesting space for us. It's, it's okay. a matter of months. It will happen very quickly and it's the biggest threat to Twitter. Okay, Don, Dodge. Thanks. And uh, during the demo session, we saw lots of companies doing real-time streams. So getting real-time information is not a problem. There's tons of it. What matters is ranking, relevance, and spam detection. So I'd like to ask, what are you guys doing to make the real-time results more relevant? Well, certainly, I think I, I totally agree that, you know, a few months ago there was something that just showed search purely by date, and people were sort of divided on whether you needed authority at all. And I think that debate will be settled relatively soon because if you only sort by date and have no concept of reputation or authority or spam or anything, that, that's a recipe for disaster. So I think no matter what your signal is, it might be how long you've been on Twitter, how many retweets you have, how many people reply to you. It might be, you know, panels of data. It could be, you know, Vipple has done Vipple's Razor, so, you know, he's got a lot of experience with spam-related stuff even before Topsy. So I think everybody will have different approaches, but if you just take the raw stream, you do have to worry about a lot of stuff polluting so, that stream. So let me add a little to that, because I think in general, you, you, we need to separate out some concepts. So the ability to rank and the ability to filter are, mm -hmm. not, are not exclusive. So ranking based on time assumes that you're taking a number of results, X number of results, and saying this is the best one. And what you're doing by doing that is you're taking time and moving it as a secondary part of the equation. What I haven't seen out there, and what I believe is important, it's not the only trick, but what's really important, I believe, to truly capture real time. We can talk about, about timely search all we want. When we're talking about real time, what I believe we're talking about is making the decision which is the right result to show this second. And it's a million decisions a second on the back end, and a certain number filter through. So I want to separate out the concept and assume that, that the idea of date ranking and time ranking is, is a dead end because it, it, it actually opens up an enormous amount of opportunity for flow. So separate out the idea that ranking is the only thing that's going to get rid of spam. Ranking is the only thing that's going to create the ability to, to overlay social networks. I think you know, that's, that's a pretty narrow-minded view. And I think if you look at the, again, back to my point about the acceleration of media, we're only at a point where people are just beginning how to publish at a rapid pace. So we need to figure out how to do things so that people can see what's going on this very second. There's going to be more and more and more content, and the ranking algorithms that take a look over just yesterday are going to be overwhelmed just as, in the same way that uh, traditional search ranking algorithms can be overwhelmed. I think the okay, whole, the whole time for one more question. Okay, the whole consumption answer and then this question. Go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll come in on pulse rank. So at One Riot, we do, we do a, a, an idea called pulse rank, which is kind of like page rank for the real-time web, in that when you do a search, the, the ranking is done at search time, which is a very unique and, and interesting approach to, to ranking. And the whole point is to create a relevant answer for your, for your search at the, at the time of search. So something might have come out 10 seconds ago or 60 seconds ago and may be the most relevant item. So we absolutely believe time is, is key and pulse rank orders uh, at, the, at the point of search. Did you have a point? Yeah, I just uh, want to say that uh, we struggle in this conference today to kind of just try to figure out where we are and, and articulate the right meanings and the right semantics to define what we're doing. And we, we haven't spent a lot of time of thinking of where we're going uh, beyond using the terms that we're already familiar with. And one has to assume that the way that people are going to ultimately benefit from this notion of this expansion of, of real-time consciousness is going to be fundamentally different than them going to a search box and just typing in, a, you know, Michael Jackson. 
it, there are going to be new ways of, of how this affects awesome. consumption, and most of the game is here. We're just beta testers on our browsers right now. And the reason it's here is because we're connected all the time. Uh, and the whole notion of the whole, the, the word augmented, which will be the next buzz thing we're going to do in two years from now, where we'll have a conference like this, it's all about augmented reality. And when you think about augmented reality, the notion of having uh, a real-time context flowing in the context of what you're doing, not necessarily in the context of what you type into a search box, is profound. Because the notion that you look at something and you see the stream immediately of what people are saying about it uh, will happen. Uh, and it will happen very aggressively. So it's not just about how to solve the filter. It's also how, how, to, how to think about the consumption piece of it. And it's, that, that consumption is not just the traditional uh, search box. It's also contextual uh, and automated and effortless. The, the, the CEO that was up here with, uh, I guess, the lazy feet, I mean, he, he made the joke, a pun about the fact that he's very lazy. But, you know, the Internet is more biology than technology. It's just a mapping of what we are as a species. And as a species, let's face it, you know, we, we strive to optimize everything to as little effort as possible. And you can call that lazy. Um, so that's where it's going to end up, just by evolution, that it's about stuff just coming to us in, in a way that's, context that's contextual. And before, it was kind of controlled, and it was old media. And now, it's democratized, and it's long tail, and, and it's beautiful. Okay, I think we're going to have to end on that. I apologize, but we're running really late. Um, so please give everyone a round of applause.